Hello, welcome. Welcome to Coast the Coast. My name is Lily Weinberg. I'm here joined with my colleague Lillian Corral, and we are thrilled to have you today. Thanks so much for joining. Lillian, can you kick us off and tell us a little bit about what we are doing with Coast to Coast? Yeah, um, it's our weekly show here at night um, and in the communities program focused on basically the conversation that's happening in cities around whether it be public spaces, um, the way the technology is impacting um, our cities, the digital divide, et cetera. So kind of really just a, a, a weekly kind of conversation around the, t the hottest topics in our communities. Yep, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, and today we are going to focus on new models emerging in public right. spaces. Um, with our communities beginning to open up further um, with unprecedented demand for public spaces that we've seen in our own communities and with summertime around the corner, um, we'll be talking with two uh, public space leaders that are really different um, on how they're managing this process. Um, we'll look into how this crisis brings opportunity to experiment, um, opening up new partnerships new ways to engage and design our public spaces. Um, Lillian, I know that, that you've been really vocal about this um, and, and, and both of us have seen um, yeah. this, this process literally play out in our own communities, you in LA, me in Miami. Um, what are you interested in hearing and learning today? Yeah, well, I mean, last week we had Carol Coletta, Alexa Bush, and Stephen Gray. And what struck me about that conversation was um, at separate times, Carol and Alexa said, you know, public spaces are free or low cost. Alexa said they should be, you know, they should not be a privilege. So I'm really curious to see um, what Robert and, and Catherine talk about in terms of like, how do we sustain them? And, and what do these models look like? Because as, as you and I um, have discussed, and I know our colleagues here at night, you know, we're really worried about what the post-COVID world looks like, especially for cities. And so how do we sustain these like really wonderful public spaces? I'm also really, really curious about how and when do we open up playgrounds? Um, we both have small children, which we talk about here and there. And I'm like, what are the rules for opening up these playgrounds? Because I don't think my child can go on any more walks. Um, I know. Yeah, that's right. That's um, I think that will be really interesting. And we can we can tee up Catherine to, to be able to answer that. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, well, great. Well, I'll see you in about 15 minutes, Lillian. And, um, and I am thrilled to welcome my guests today, uh, Robert Hammond and Catherine Utlevel. Uh, so I will take a second to introduce both. Um, I won't read your full bios, but uh, Robert Hammond is the founder and executive director of the Highline, and Catherine Otlevel is the commissioner of Parks and Recreation for the city, city of Philadelphia. Thanks so much for joining us and taking 30 minutes out of your very, very busy day. Thanks How's it that. going? <laughs> great, great to be here, Lil. Good, good, good. Um, so, so I want to just tee it up for, for how this conversation is going to unfold. We have 30 minutes together, approximately. Um, you two will chat with me for about 15 minutes. Um, we're going to do rapid fire questions, OK? Um, and then Lillian will join, and we'll be getting questions from the audience. And, and so audience members, please ask your questions in the Q&A box. Um, you're going to see that. And we are monitoring those questions. If you're joining on Facebook Live, Live. Um, you can ask questions there, but hashtag night live, okay? Um, and then Lillian will jump in and spend about 10 minutes um, getting those questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up, okay? So it should be fun. All right, so Catherine, I'm gonna um, ask you the first question. Um, so you've been very, very vocal um, about the essential service of parks during this time. Um, you've been a great advocate. Um, can you set some framing um, for how you manage to keep um, parks open? And, and what does that even mean that, that parks are an essential service? So tee us up. Yeah, you know, um, since I've been in the parks and rec world over the past 10 years or so, um, you know, I, I think there has just been a shifting narrative in, um, you know, the role of parks and recreation. And I think we've seen that narrative shift from, oh, parks are, you know, um, it's, a, it's an environmental issue or it's, a, it's a, you know, it's about sustainability, which of course it is and always will be. But we've seen a shift to, to move towards parks um, as civic infrastructure, you know, and I think there's a further shift that the you know um, COVID um, pandemic has has showed us that parks are an essential human and social service, parks and recreation. You know, this isn't just about the environment. This isn't just about infrastructure. This is about an essential service that we provide to humans everywhere on our planet. And um, and you know when we were closing schools and closing gyms and closing. Um, 
you know, so many, um, so many things throughout the, the country, uh, parks remained open and people, um, you know, were, were desperate for that. And, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, not just the idea of the space, but also the services that we're providing in Philly, you know, we shifted gears completely to food access and we opened up, turned our rec centers into food pantries and started meal distribution and assigned staff to, to get, you know, get boxes of food packed for folks. And so um, we are absolutely providing those essential services. Um, the challenge is that, you know, we're, we're never funded as an essential service. So that shift has not happened. Narratively, we have the shift, but not, uh, you know, financially. That's great. Um, and, and, and so, Robert, um, you've, you've been in a, in a bit of a different situation. Um, the High Line is, is, is fundamentally different and, and has, has different design, and, and you've had to close down. Um, and so what went into making that decision, and have you been able to engage with um, your users and communities in other ways? Yeah. So the High Line is technically, we're classified as a building because we have limited exits. And so what is one of the highlighting things most known for is being crowded. <laughs> and so right as soon as this started happening, we realized we couldn't keep social distancing on the highline. A lot of the highline is only, the path is only eight feet wide. So we closed down about two weeks ago. Um, and now what we're trying to do is figure out how, do we, how can we open back up? How can we open in this completely new world um, in a safe way? And so it brings up a lot of interesting issues. I mean, there's some obviously, you know, so many bad things about this pandemic. One of the good things is we've all, we built the High Line for New Yorkers, but most of our users were tourists. And so now when we reopen, we're gonna be mostly New Yorkers again. So that is uh, one of the good things. And how do, we, how do we open in a way that New Yorkers want us to open while keeping it safe? So. Yeah, and so this is really relevant for, for many of our audience members as they think about, you know, libraries or, or other post-industrial, you know, because because the High Line is, is, is categorized as a building. So they're gonna be thinking about many of the same things. Um, and and so so I, I do wanna dig in a little bit deeper with with both of you about about new partnerships. And and so Catherine, one of the things that you talked about um, was, was it's food distribution and 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 how that's that's been a service that's that's occurred in many of your parks the other day in uh, Miami I, I was going out for a very early morning jog around 6 a.m and there were cars lined up um, on my usually quiet neighborhood street because they were lined up to get their meals um, at the local park in my neighborhood um, and so so I would like to to dig in Catherine with you a bit more about what are some of the new partnerships that you've seen that have emerged or been elevated um, in this crisis? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, what we're used to talking about in the public space world in terms of partnerships is, is mostly, um, you know, nonprofit partners. And we have, you know, incredible nonprofit partners, um, you know, here in Philly that, that support our work and we couldn't do our work without them. Um, but, you know, at a time like this, the nonprofit community is struggling too, right? And they are, you know, fighting for their own survival, right? And trying to contingency plan and scenario plan for what the future of their organization looks like. So what's interesting to me is that I've seen a shift over the last eight weeks in that the folks that I'm leaning on the most during this crisis are fellow city agencies. So mm -hmm. the National Parks and Rec Association has set up, I have to give them a huge shout out because they've set up these weekly calls um, with urban park directors from, ac from across the country. So about 60, folks in my position in other big cities get on a call, you know, a Zoom call every Friday at noon. And it has, I'm clinging to that call, you know, because we're all making this up as we go. We're sharing information like crazy, you know, oh, you did this, send me that deck so I can replicate and do that in Philly. Or Philly, somehow you made this happen. How did you do it? What's everyone thinking about? What's everyone's timelines? You know, what's it, how's everyone's political dynamics working? what's happening with your budget. And the information share is in real time and it's very dynamic and it's very honest and transparent. And that's not a partnership that, that to be honest, that we really exploited that much. You know, you're sort of in a silo mentality in big cities and you're so focused on your own, you know, dynamics and your own politics. Um, but at a time like this, when everybody's trying to figure this out, that to me has been an incredible partnership to, to really get to know at a time of crisis, these other park directors and um, you know, just just trust their their advice and their insight, and we're we're all learning and moving together. 
And, and, and Robert, I mean, you, you've set up a network that, that has been able to support the Highline Network, which we, we um, was a partner last, last week in our Coast to Coast. Um, I know for a fact, um, I serve on the board of the Underline, um, that network has been uh, just extremely important for, for figuring out you know, the next steps uh, for COVID-19. Um, but the same question for you, um, I, I would like to know, I mean, as you're, you're still not open yet, um, you're figuring out um, how to open. Um, you know, so, so how will the Highline look different and, and what are some of the emerging ways that you see um, new partnerships for, for whatever the, the new Highline will, will look like? Yeah, well, you know, what we reflexively, when we want to go back to the community, we, we want to know what they want to do us to do, when they want us to open, how they want us to open. But for a lot of people, that's not their primary concern. They don't really give that. that <laughs> people are trying to survive, not caring necessarily about when they go on the high line. So one of the things we did is try to figure out what could we do in the short term in this emergency. So we partnered with our local city councilman, who's also the speaker, Corey Johnson, to offer meals. Part, we partnered with uh, Fresh Direct to offer boxes that would last families for a week. We had our staff and volunteers make calls to seniors in the neighborhood to make sure they were getting the services they need. So sort of leaning back on these relationships that we built up over, over the past 20 years. Um, I think, you know, physically, the, the, one of the biggest questions I get asked about the Highline is how, how are the plants? Because yeah. our gardeners haven't been up there. And luckily this is the best time of year for people not to be up there and we've had a really wet, cool spring, um, but we're working to get them back up there. It's also a resilient landscape. It's, it's a lot of um, native plants. And so our gardeners say it's gonna look different forever and maybe in good and different ways. Mm. Um, we wanna leave parts of it so you can actually see how this time affected the plants. Um, and then on the network, you know, a lot of people think the Highline Network is something where we're teaching others, but it's really how do we all learn from each other? Because I've learned um, so much from other, it's been fascinating to hear what the Beltline has been doing because they are a very busy park um, on an old rail line that has actually been open. So we've learned from a lot from them how they've been able to stay open through this. Yeah, and they're a transportation corridor. So, I mean, that's that's been critical for them to stay open. Um, in the chat function, we're going to link to um, the Highline Network because they are still accepting applications for as part of their network until May 31st. Um, so, so with that, I, I want to pivot a little bit. I want to talk about, um, you know, how how um, this this crisis perhaps has um, spurred some creativity, um, and 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 in particular, Catherine, I want to I want to dig into um, what what have you seen that's that's potentially been creative, um, you know, from creative thinking um, from uh, from COVID nineteen? Um, and I would love for you to highlight um, the expansion of of Play Streets, um, which we're also going to link to that that new article about um, how the Play Streets program has expanded in Philly. Yeah, um, you know, we we've definitely had to be had to be creative and think on our feet, which is you know it's it's it can be a little challenging when you're in city government to be nimble, um, but um, it's certainly uh, you know it's certainly been something that we've needed to do. And you know, Clay Streets are really um, it's interesting because uh, you know as we think about what's the summer going to look like, are we going to be able to host summer camps? You know, we did cancel our pool season, so we know pools aren't going to be open. Um, you know, kids have been cooped up for you know two months going on almost three months and um you know as you said us as parents and and as residents in the city we we know that you know kids need to be outside they need to be um they need to have some safe fun structured activities and so we looked at this um this program that's been happening in philly for 60 years which is our play streets program which is basically a meal distribution program you know from the 1960s um that we still do and through play streets and our summer camps we serve it's a it's a meal distribution program primarily we serve 20,000 meals a day um, at 150 summer camps and, and 350 play streets and basically a resident can just apply to have their street designated as a play street which means we'll deliver meals and they can close the street every day between 10 and 4. 
you know, it has to have certain criteria. It's a one-way street. It's a non-numbered street and not a bus route. But, you know, they're really popular and it's very grassroots. Um, yeah. And so we look, we're looking at play streets to say, if kids can't get to rec centers, how do we get to the kids? You know, how do yeah. we meet the kids where they are this summer? Not just with a meal, but with fun, safe, structured activities. Um, and so we're doing these, we're planning these play street enhancements. We're not exactly sure what that's going to look like yet, but, you know, just um, an extra something for young people this summer in their own neighborhood, right on, right outside their front door, um, where we can, you know, connect them with some caring adults and some socially distanced, appropriate, fun activities um, and and gifts, you know, um, to make the summer, you know, um, it's it's going to be a summer like no other, but it doesn't have to be a bummer of a summer, you know, it can be, yeah. it can still be fun and joyful, and that's going to be our goal yeah. for, through Play Streets. And what I love about about this program is that it's so simple. I mean, it's literally, from my understanding, it's, it's a rope, right, that that goes up, you know, on the side of the, the, the street. And then, yeah. you know, you can really take back your street as a public space, um, yeah. Yeah. which is. which is is simple, but but is, is hard to do. Um, yeah. And and then I also love that it's that it's within the hands of, of the neighbors, the neighbor leaders, and it's really driven by by community. So I love that. Um, last question before we we um, uh, pivot and invite Lillian in is, is um, and I'll start with you, Robbie, um, is, is, you know, of course, there's extreme economic and operational challenges um, facing our cities. And, and so I would love to hear from, from you about how you're trying to um, lead with equity and inclusivity um, in the recovery. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think one thing is, is how if we open with limited capacity, so we're not going to be able to have, you know, we used to have 65,000 people in, on a weekend day on the highway. Now, we're not going to have quite the demand because we're going to have less tourists, but I think we're going to have more New Yorkers. So how do we open and make sure everyone is welcome? I think that's the biggest, to people outside the parks world, I think they think, well, if something's free and open to the park, doesn't everyone feel accessible to it? But that's definitely not the case. Just because you're open and free doesn't mean everyone feels welcome. Yeah. And so I think we sort of have some opportunities here. How do we tailor how we open to make sure everyone feels it's specifically for them. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, for a lot of, for the past few years, we've been dealing with over success. I mean, that's what the story of New York, too many people, too much money in too, in, in too few places. Yeah. Um, and so now we're gonna, New York is gonna be having an existential crisis of yeah. how does it survive? How does culture and culture, I mean, museums and parks survive because they're sort of, they're the first thing that usually gets cut on the funding and how does it return? And I, I think there is some opportunity how it's going to shift away from tourists and more yeah. focused on New Yorkers. Yeah. I think that is really interesting how the Highline will, will be become more hyper local. Um, so that, that isn't, that is an opportunity. So we're going to pause here. We're at 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to invite Lillian to, to hop in and um, Lillian's been getting questions from um, the audiences um, at the audience and, um, and then we'll, um, we'll close. So. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Lily. Um, so a fascinating conversation, Catherine and Ravi. Um, one thing, um, a couple of things have come up, so we'll try to get through it. But the first thing I guess I wanted to talk about was the point of round culture that you just brought up, Robert. There's a couple of questions around the role of artists, um, perhaps partnerships with artistic institutions and public spaces. And then also, like, what do we do with a lot of these interactive type of experiences that we've tried to do in the past when we've tried to bring art into public spaces now in this world where we can't be all touching the same thing? Um, any thoughts on on that for me? I mean, yeah, you know, I think this is going to be a real opportunity for parks to really flex that art muscle. Um, it's something we've done since we've opened is we display public art that normally you would see in museums or galleries and bringing it out into the public. It's always changing. And it's, it's been one of the most popular programs we, we've done. And I think it will be more so. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that um, in other parks that have not done that partnering with institutions that aren't going to be able to show as much art. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. We're going to be, this summer, we're going to be showing our next, um, we have something called the Plinth that's right over 10th Avenue. It's a big, we have an emo amazing Simone Lee piece there. And we're going to be showing the 80 submissions of that. In the past, we hadn't made all those public, but we want to bring the public into that process 
um, to start thinking about what would they want to see, you know, in their right. public. And Catherine, for you, in terms of as a city parks commissioner, like how do you um, how do you see the kinds of partnerships that um, Robbie describes um, in yeah, terms so of bringing arts into the space? Yeah, we're more thinking about it from a programming standpoint, and you know, it's it, just like kids might not be able to get to rec centers; they they're not going to be able to get to museums in the same way that they were. And field trips, as we know it, are like on a pause right now. And so um, we're again talking to tons of arts organizations locally about play streets, about other programming that we do. Because um, one thing we always say is we have access to kids. So if you have stuff you want to get to kids, you know, like we can get you to the kids. Um, you know, just so so I think it's really about us at city government being open to the those partnerships, you know, giving people the opportunity, the avenues to find a way in to work with the audiences that we're serving and, and all of the residents. And, and again, I think it's time for arts organizations to, everybody's got to be nimble. Everybody has to be, um, you know, creative in not just their, their artistic practice, but in their logistics and their operations, you know, um, how do we, you know, again, if we can't, if you, if the kids can't get to you, how do you get to the young people? How do you get to the communities? And some of the local arts organizations that we're planning to work with this summer have been thinking about that. And so we're really excited. Right. That's a, that's a good segue to the next question that came up, which is, what are ways that nonprofits can support parks and public spaces? Do you have any like quick, um, quick guides? Yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're going to, we're seeing a $13 million budget cut. That's 20%, one fifth of our budget um, is gone yeah. uh, for, for FY21. Um, and, you know, just based on the calls I got, um, you know, yesterday around trash and parks over the weekend, we're at a stay at home order in Philly and our parks are still slammed and there is, you know, more trash than ever. And to be honest, we're not just behind on hiring our seasonals because we've been closed for eight weeks, but we don't, you know, we're going to be short on overtime on seasonal employees. We're not going to be able to hire the same at the same level we were and you know my message to our 110 park friends groups and our advisory councils is we're going to need your support now more than ever i mean you're going to have to fill in with you know we're criti critical city services fall short um at least for the next year or so uh, rob i just want to jump in there just yeah you know, this is where i think we're going to have to have a new conversation about public funding of parks public funding of parks has gone down in most cities even as the economy has gone up and you're gonna see a lot of cuts to parks when they're more needed. And so I think we need to do as, and, and not money for the high line, but for parks, um, you know, just there's the rank and file parks that don't have a private group raising money for them. And I think we're gonna all need to band together to make that a really important conversation. And so I urge people, let your elected officials know um, how important parks are and they're a tiny minuscule, it's less than one half of 1% of the New York City budget, but everyone is using them right now. And so yeah. I think that's where we just need to let our elected officials know that we, 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 that's where we want our tax dollars going. So last week, this point was made that um, we really need to think about that funding conversation as one of like uh, one more around the terms of economic development, like what parks bring into cities and things like that on the economic development argument. Um, Catherine, do you think that's the right approach or, or what are some other ways that you think we can make this case clearly that these spaces are important to maintain? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've had the luxury of being on both sides, right? Like I ran a park conservancy and I raised money for parks and now I'm running a city agency. And when I was on the nonprofit side, I was like, you know, I, I, I and I still am like, we have to, we have to fund our parks fairly and we have to fund our parks, you know, especially the parks that can't raise money for themselves. You know, we have to, we have to support them. Now that I'm on the, um, you, you know, and, and I'll say in the, in the first three weeks of this crisis, you know, I was incredibly optimistic because I kept reading all of the op-eds and the social media media posts about how essential parks were and their sanctuaries yeah. and we love them and what would, where would we be without them and yet you know when push comes to shove our budget gets cut by 13 million dollars now that said if i'm on my our mayor jim kenny who i love and who's been a huge advocate of parks what, what choices can I make? I'm a, we have a city with 25% poverty. You know, we have a pandemic that has hit our city. You know, when you have to make really critical choices because our parks department is funded out of the general fund, you know, yeah. you have to make those choices. And so I think that it is, it does have to be about where else can the money come from? What other types of dedicated funding streams can we identify for parks? Because when park systems rely on the general fund for their budget, it doesn't work. Rob, any any other comments on that or? 
I think something Stephen Gray said uh, last week that was really important. I mean, the reason the High Line exists is because we made the economic argument to the city. Um, but now what I'm seeing more of is parks making the equity argument that, yeah. that parks and that parks not just in wealthy neighborhoods. But I think the 11th Street Bridge in Washington is a great example. Um, that's been their primary driver. And if, if, if people haven't looked at it, it's worth looking at their um, equitable development plan. And they're getting funding because of that argument. They're making the economic argument, but they're making the argument this makes good sense for um, preserving um, neighborhoods, not just changing and bringing new economic development. So I think it's paired. Um, but the national, I think we also have to make it on a national level that at some point we're going to have an infrastructure bill and parks are never part of that. Infrastructures are thought of as bridges and roads and parks are critical, as Eric Kleinenberg has said on this, it are our civic public infrastructure and we need yeah. to have that. And I, and I, and I also think that, that the, the conversation, there's also a lot of state and federal money around social service funding and human service funding. And I think that, you know, from a, from a mental health, physical health standpoint that we have to start to weave parks into that conversation too, because making parks part of civic infrastructure is just going to get us capital dollars. And what we need is operating dollars. We need boots on the ground who are supporting these parks. And by the way, huge opportunities around employment and workforce development, right? I'll take money from wherever we can get it. I just don't necessarily think it needs to come from the general fund that's also supporting police and fire and schools and everything else. So it definitely sounds like different kinds of partnerships are going to have to come together to really make this case because it, it seems like it's a, also a collaboration you're mentioning social service agencies and parks and we're talking about artistic institutions do you think there is a challenge there, there's going to be any challenge in fostering that kind of collaboration and my next question that came up is what is the role of public engagement how are you asking the public for their feedback but also to your point, um, Robbie, like if you if we want them to call our elected officials, how are we how are we communicating with them about about this um, the urgency of public spaces and the value of them as well? Well, if you know park advocates, you never have to ask for their feedback. <laughs> <laughs> They're quite proactive. <laughs> but go ahead, Rob. But, well, I think the challenge for us is a lot of the people that yes, we have some people that we hear feedback from all the time. All the time. One of the challenges is how do you get people that are not engaged in the process to be part of the process? So for example, this issue of how do we open? We had a hard time engaging with people. We have two large um, low income housing developments next to the High Line. So it was hard enough when we could meet with them in person. What do you do when you can't do anything in person? And there's this digital divide and we have a lot of elderly residents. How do we engage with them when we can't even do it in, per in person? And so I think that's, it's one, it's an opportunity because we're going to really have to figure that out literally in the next few months um, of, of how do you do that. And one of the, the good examples of people who do this right is politicians because they're going to they're gonna figure out how to get every single voter. And so looking at how do campaigns, yes. you know, mobilize communities. Um, and so I think that's where we can take a playbook from them and starting to look at some totally of their, the technology they use. Totally agree. That's great. And then the last question sort of related to that, there's a, a lot of great questions again on the, on the Q&A. Thank you everyone for participating is how do we, and, and you were talking a little bit before we started um, about this, uh, both of you, how do we actually design these spaces with the six with the six foot um, requirement and make sure that there's still sort of the welcoming spaces. We're seeing a lot of issues, Catherine, in public parks where people are just not keeping distance. I mean, again, any thoughts or best practices was the question around how do we make sure and think through the six foot rule? I think what New York has done around the social distance ambassadors has been fantastic. Um, we're taking, we're literally just like replicating that exact program um, in Philly. We're looking at, at how we can do that. I think, um, you know, having people who are not law enforcement out there educating and engaging, not enforcing, but educating and engaging folks around why the, why we're doing this, why it's important, um, what it can mean. You know, um, I think I think you have to meet people where they are. You know, we've tried signage. We put up 7,000 signs, regular signs, lawn signs, small signs, big signs, on a box signs, you name it. We put up the signs and it's a little bit like white noise right now. So yeah. I think, um, you know, the idea of meeting people where they are and what New York has done has been really great. Great. 
Any other thoughts, Robbie? And then, all right. Well, thanks so much for answering our questions, Lily. Um, do you want to? come back and close it out for us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lily. And that was, that was awesome. I feel like we could go for another 30 minutes. Um, thanks so much for, for the good conversation. We have a, an audience full of practitioners. So I want to, I want to give the opportunity for, for both um, Robert and, and Catherine, for you to just leave um, just a, any, any final remarks, any final advice, um, uh, just 30 seconds. So um, Catherine. Any oh, final advice? Um, you no, know, everybody should continue to love their parks and, um, you know, just take care of each other and stay safe and, you know, and advocate and love your parks. And Robbie. Thank, those, thank those people that are working in their parks because they're under so much pressure and so much work and having to deal with all this. So, you know, thank you, Catherine, and thank you for all of you out there that are, you know, in this field that are working every day. So I thank you and I hope you'll remember to thank them. Um, when you see them. That's right. Well, well, thanks to to both of you for for joining us today. Um, we had a really a, a great conversation, and I appreciate um, really a, a call to action um, for for more investments in our in our public spaces, and which I think is is, is very important. Um, and, and so so. Coast to Coast um, every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Um, and our next episode, um, we'll be talking about taking back our streets during COVID-19, new possibilities for public spaces and our downtowns and recoveries. Um, so, so that should be a really interesting episode. Um, Robert and Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Lillian, um, I'll yep. see you back here at the same I'll time, see same you place. Next week. Bye. Take care.